שלום, סיסטר. שלום, אלישבע. שלום. אוקיי, תודה רבה לכולם על הדיון הזה. תודה רבה, ירמיהו ומבורים של הירות אינדיה. Um, we have even friends from uh, Malaysia who are tuning in and a member from who is in Bahrain at the moment. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm very, very, very excited to have Yermia who here for the first time. And I hope it's not the last time. <laughs> so I'm going to start with an introduction um, because this is the first time that Yermi Yahoo's come on, so um, I would like to introduce you to him. Um, Yermi Yahoo Danzik is an Israeli activist for Jewish and indigenous rights, as well as for improving relations between Jews and Arabs. He's a writer and speaker specializing in Jewish diversity, history, and identity. Yermi Yahoo is of Caribbean, Ashkenazi, and old Yishuv Jewish descent. He served as a squad commander in a counter-terrorist unit of the Israeli border police. He speaks Hebrew, English, Arabic, Yiddish, and Guyanese Creole. He's currently the director of education for the Herut movement. His work is focused on providing the Jewish community and its allies with a more holistic and aboriginally rooted understanding of Hebrew history and identity, unapologetic advocacy for justice and equality in Israeli society, and equipping individuals and communities in the diaspora with the tools to strengthen their identity and confront anti-Semitism and bigotry in all its forms. So I am very happy to have you on, Yermi Yahu. Thank you so much. And um, I hope we will learn Uh, a great lot today. So um, I'm leaving it up to you. Thank you, Shalom. Thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, I've seen so many amazing uh, photos and I've read uh, some incredible content that uh, your fearless leader uh, Rivka has been sharing about everything that's been happening in Herut, India. Um, so it's an incredible honor for me to meet some of you today. Uh, and hopefully this can be uh, more of a discussion, right? Uh, as opposed to just a, a presentation Um, because ultimately, we are all, uh, as Jews, as Zionists, we are all actors in this unfolding drama that is Jewish history and history of the modern state of Israel, uh, which really is our third try at it, right? We've had two previous Jewish commonwealths in the past, and this is our third uh, attempt to, to get things right. Um, and that has come with incredible victories and triumphs and miracles. Um, but also its uh, fair share of challenges. And uh, today we're going to be discussing uh, one of those challenges. Um, can I share my uh, screen? Yes. Is, uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Do you see my screen? Great. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so we're going to be discussing today B'nai uh, Anusim. And before we get into what are B'nai Anusim, uh, I think it's important because today is the, uh, the Levaya, the funeral of uh, Harab uh, Chaim Kanievsky, though we also mentioned the fact that part of his life um, had an effect on this specific question of B'nai Anusim. Um, more than one time, people came to him with this question of what do, of the fact that there are banana seam in the world, people with this identity that we're going to be discussing today, and whether or not the Jewish world, the rabbinical leadership of, this, of today's generation has something to say about this. And his answer was unequivocally yes, that this is something that we need to not only have an answer for, but we need to be proactive in this manner. Uh, and perhaps at the end, if we have time, we can get back into what his specific advice was. But we, it's very important to know what today's uh, passing of was certainly uh, one of the leading 
authorities in halakha, in Jewish law today, that uh, he was not silent on the issue. So before we get into what the formal definition of what uh, a ben anus is or bat anus, bnei anusim are, um, I, I put it very clearly right here, right? It's a message because we need to understand that whenever we talk about these issues, these are not just theoretical. We're living these realities, right? And even if we're not banan of seem ourselves, we might know somebody who is, who comes from this background. Um, and even if we don't know somebody, we have a stake in the Jewish future. So we have, should have something to say about this, right? So the first thing that's important that the we uh, coming out as Zionists, as people that know that this is an issue which is important for us to have an answer for, that we let people know that just because their ancestors were forced to hide their Jewishness doesn't make them any less of a Jew today, right? The fact that somebody comes from that background, from that history, doesn't make their identity any less than somebody whose ancestors didn't go through that. So the, the bias here, from my perspective, from Herut's perspective, is that people coming from this background, and we're gonna get into what this background is, deserve our support, not our suspicion. You know, because we have enough suspicion going around in our community. We have enough people being doubted for their sincerity. At, if somebody comes to us and has a real honest intention to be a part of the Jewish people, our first response should be, how can we support you? Not what can we do to keep you away or to suspect you? So who are bananas so it's obviously a Hebrew term. B'nai means children, and anusim means the forced ones, right, or coerced ones. Um, and so the idea is, is that we have, through various periods of Jewish history, you have Jews, Israelites, depending on where they are part of the world, there's different words that have been used to describe our people, the people of Israel, uh, but people who belong to our nation that were forced or coerced to stop practicing the ancestral faith of the people of Israel, to stop being outwardly Jewish, to start being stop being outwardly Israelite. And halakha, Hebrew law, has always had something to say about this, right? So the concept, the word itself, b'nei nusim, actually comes from a, a word in the Talmud, in uh, in uh, Masechet Avodah Zarah, in Masechet, which just talks about uh, idol worship, uh, foreign worship, uh, and there's this concept of avera uh, be'ones, right? Which means a transgression or sin that was forced on. It wasn't something that you chose to do willingly. Um, and there's so many different times this happened throughout the diaspora. Um, and the most famous is in Spain during the Spanish Inquisition. But it's important to mention, we'll come back to this point, but the idea of Bnei of Jews, of Israelites that were forced to abandon their faith outwardly is not something which is unique to Spain and to the Sephardic experience. It's something which was experienced by, by Jews in Ethiopia to a very intense degree. It was experienced by Jews in what is today Nigeria. It was experienced by Jews uh, in places of India as well. We can come back to that, right? But this idea of somebody being a descendant of uh, people who were forced to hide their Jewishness is something which existed pretty much since the beginning of the diaspora. So we're gonna focus now on the most famous case because really uh, it's famous because it created the most extensive uh, population of bananas seem today. So the Spanish Inquisition, by the way, if I say something that somebody doesn't understand, always feel free to stop me, ask a question, uh, no problem at all. So the Spanish Inquisition, um, people, a lot of people know the date 1492, right? The 1492, Columbus sailed and discovered the new world. Uh, and shortly before that, you have the Alhambra Decree. And the Alhambra decree, which basically said to the entire Jewish community of Spain, you either convert to Catholicism or you are expelled. But we have to remember that the Inquisition began before the Alhambra decree, right? In 1478, we already have uh, tribunals being created 
this cooperation between the Catholic Church, uh, between the papacy, and between the, uh, the government, the monarchy of Spain, to start to create these tribunals to police uh, what is called uh, Cristianos Nuevos, these new Christians, right? Because up in, in, in the late 1300s, we have horrible cases of violence, pogroms, all in many different areas uh, on the Iberian Peninsula, and forced, which included forced baptism. So we have this phenomenon of new Christians, and very quickly, the Christian population, the old Christian population, is looking at these new Christians and they're saying, these people don't look like they're really uh, honest Catholics. It looks like they're still doing things like lighting candles on Friday night. And they're not eating, uh, they won't eat the food that we all eat at the local inn, right? They're not participating in the local mass, right? There was something which was very clear to them that these new Christians are probably not real Christians and, and what is likely happening is that the Jews that haven't converted to Christianity yet are influencing these new converts to Christianity to come back into the Jewish fold. And so a lot of different voices from within the church, some of them unfortunately being uh, Christian uh, Jewish apostates, Jews that convert to Christianity, actually were encouraging the monarchy, you know, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella to issue the Alhambra decree, to make this ultimatum to the Jewish community of Spain, saying that everybody has to convert or face expulsion. And the result is in 1492, that you have hundreds of thousands of convert conversos and moriscos, right? So for the Jewish population of what we then known as conversos or pejoratively as moranos, which means pigs, right? It was like a curse word that they used to describe these uh, Jewish converts to Christianity. We have somewhere around a quarter million people a uh, quarter million Jews that then became these uh, Nuevos Cristianos, these new Christians. Um, but we also, it's important to mention, have these other population in Spain called the Moriscos. And the Moriscos were Muslims, right? So we have to remember that Spain, Iberia, has this history of it being this kind of uh, friction point between the Christian world and the Muslim world. And so there was lots of Muslims in addition to Jews in Christian Spain. And so the Inquisition, although it hyper-focused on Jews because Jews are always the most convenient scapegoat, also targeted Muslims. So after the Alhambra decree, we had mass conversions of not only conversos, which were Jews, but also moriscos, which were Muslims. And now we'll get into the next step of that, which was that there was a mass uh, expulsion uh, of the Jewish people of the Sephardic uh, community, which then created the Sephardic diaspora, which we can see on this map here, uh, many of the locations that they fled to. Um, most of them went to other places in the Mediterranean basin. Most Sephardim went to places in Southern Europe, went to North Africa, uh, but also to a lesser degree, uh, went to the land of Israel, uh, to uh, Amsterdam, to, to England, and also to the Americas, which is something like my family on my mother's side is descended of Sephardic Jews that fled to the Caribbean, um, and also to varying degrees also to India. So to kind of bring it a little bit more home for our community of Herut, India, uh, I'm sure many of you know that there, the Inquisition didn't just stay in Spain. It followed the Spanish and then also the Portuguese uh, to their colonies. So a lot of those Jews that fled the Iberian Peninsula, either from Spain or from Portugal, uh, to, so that they can practice their Judaism freely, ended up finding themselves in Spanish or Portuguese colonies. Most of those were in the New World. So for example, if you were a Jew that fled to, to Brazil or to Mexico or to Cuba and all these different pl other places, all of a sudden you found that, okay, you had maybe some brief freedom to practice your Judaism and to live your Jewish life as you see fit. And then all of a sudden on the next boat or shortly after, you have some uh, uh, inquisitors arriving who have brought the inquisition to these new places. And this was certainly the case throughout the Caribbean and what became Latin America. 
but it was also the case in Goa, in, um, in southern India. Um, so as an extension of the Portuguese Inquisition, which began in 1536, so basically in the Iberian Peninsula, you had a lot of Jews fleeing from Spain after the 1492 Alhambra Decree into Portugal to basically to receive refuge so they can live Jewishly. And then the church in Portugal pressured the monarchy to then also have their own inquisition, which basically meant in from 1536 mass baptisms. Like they would literally, you would have crowds of hundreds of thousands of people and uh, and you would have priests just sprinkling holy water on, on these crowds and saying, you're now all Christian. Um, and so almost immediately in the new Portuguese uh, colony in Goa, this anti-Semitic violence and really this general uh, Catholic intolerance of other religions from that time period uh, began in Goa. So the, the Inquisition of Goa was officially established in 1560, but we, can, we already have records from decades before that uh, of Jews being burnt at the stake and also of Hindu temples being demolished and destroyed basically everywhere they existed in Goa. Uh, and part of the reason that the Inquisition in Goa took such a violent character um, it, even compared to what was going on in other parts of the world with these kind of local inquisitions that were emanating out of Iberia was the fact that the Goan inquisitors had to deal with the reality of there being other Jewish communities in India, right? So it's like, if you were a Jew fleeing to the Caribbean, you weren't going to a place where there was already other Jewish communities, right? You were going there and pot possibly creating your own new community in a new land for the Jewish people. But in Goa, in India, that was certainly not the case. And if you were a Sephardic Jew who has just arrived in Goa and was trying to set down roots there, if you just went a little bit more south, you would get to the Malabar coast. And the Malabar coast was home to a very ancient Cochin Jewish community. And the reality is, is that with the rise of the Inquisition in Goa, you have Sephardic Jews fleeing from there and going and settling among the Malabar Cochin community, which really, they have their own separate history. That's a subject for another lecture. Very interesting, super fascinating. But the, uh, the point being that the inquisitors in Goa made a specific effort to prevent Sephardic Jews from having any type of relationship with other Jews in the area, in, specifically in uh, Cochin. So we've mentioned a few things that the inquisitors would do, burning people at the stake. But even before we get to the point of burning people at the stake, you had wanton violence all over the place. You have Jews being ripped out of their homes. You have them being tortured in unimaginable ways. I don't think we need to go into the details of exactly what happened in the inquisition, but we're talking about unbelievable uh, forms of violence meant to elicit a terrible amount of suffering with the specific goal of not only having the person themselves admit to pretending to be Christian or admit to spreading Judaism to other people, particularly to fellow Jews, uh, but also to get them to, uh, to uh, the word in Hebrew is a machine, to inform on other people. Right. So the idea was that if I was to, you know, arrest, God forbid, uh, Rivka, I want to make sure also that in my horrible acts of torture, that I also have uh, Rivka admit who else in the community is secretly living as Jews. Right. And the way that they did that was about doing horrible things of violence. So we spoke a little bit right now about what happened in Spain. Um, and it's important to also remember that this ultimatum of abandon Judaism, accept Christianity uh, or die wasn't unique to the Sephardic experience, definitely not unique to what was going on in the Spanish and Portuguese uh, countries, but also in their colonies. It was also something which was very much the reality for most of Jewish history in Ethiopia. Ethiopia, uh, 
you know, for many people know a little bit about the history that there was a very ancient Jewish community there. It's been there since basically since the first temple period, similar to the Jewish community of Cochin, by the way. Um, but a lot of people don't know is that the Ethiopian Jewish community, Beta Israel, had to deal with a very intolerant and violent church in Ethiopia. The Tawahedo Orthodox Church in Ethiopia was extremely anti-Semitic. Uh, and basically the entire history book of Jews in Ethiopia is just a redundant, painful history of the church and the Ethiopian empire uh, conquering the Jewish regions of Ethiopia, forcing them to adopt Christianity. And the result of that was that many, many Jews had to go and live in hiding. And the result of that today is that just like we have throughout Latin America, millions of people with this B'nai Anusim identity, these identities that they've been practicing Judaism in secret for generations and generations, just like we can see that amongst people in Latin America and also in India, you also see that in Ethiopia, um, and there's a lot of different communities in Ethiopia that are starting to reemerge and discuss their identity and how it is that their ancestors were forced to practice their Judaism in hiding. So when we look back at this experience of die or convert to Christianity, a lot of us look at that very sympathetically, hopefully, and we say, you know what, maybe I would have done something different but it's impossible for me to know. And even more than that, I can't, I don't have the right to judge the people that had to deal with that question. In the same way that we look at the generation that experienced the most recent horrific tragedy of Jewish history, the Holocaust, none of us understand what it's like to be in those shoes. And so therefore we cannot judge those people. And for most of those Jews, whether they are in Ethiopia or Goa or Latin America or in Spain itself, Right? They saw baptism, accepting the, the Catholic faith as a means for them to survive. And so that one day their descendants will be able to return to Judaism openly. So in that spirit, a lot of the foremost rabbinical authorities agreed exactly with that same sentiment. And the reality is, is that when we look at a lot of these authorities, they were Sephardic Jews themselves. And, and, and when we look at the different authorities that were, say, more strict on the issue of Bananusim and those that were more flexible, right? The majority of those that were strict were Ashkenazim, and the majority of those that are flexible on the, on the issue of Bananusim were Sephardim. There's a very complex history as to why that is. In short, and we can maybe, if in the question and answer period, maybe we can get more into this. But in Ashkenaz, that is Central uh, Europe, Western and Central Europe, uh, the practice was set from a very early period in Jewish history in that region that when the Christians would come in and kill Jews and try and force them to convert. The Ashkenazi practice was to choose death. And that's something that happened throughout the Rhineland, throughout the areas of Ashkenaz, is that we have all these, uh, these horrific stories. A lot of them we read on Tisha B'Av about synagogues being set aflame with all of the inhabitants of the Jewish village inside. That was the practice in Ashkenaz. Why that is, that's a longer story. Maybe we can get to that later. But in, in Sfarad, in the Iberian Peninsula, that was not the practice. You know, the practice, generally speaking, and this was a, with halachic support, was that if you have the ability to choose life, and that means, uh, at least outwardly, rejecting your Jewish faith, then you should choose life. And, and the reason why that this was something that was given so much support is because a lot of the great rabbis of that period, they knew if they didn't experience it themselves, they had family members that experienced it, right? They, come, they came from communities that survived it, um, and so a lot of the um, foremost figures of, uh, of Sephardic halakha, not just Sephardic halakha, but halakha for the whole Jewish community, uh, came out very much in support of B'nai Nusim uh, in their full integration in the Jewish community. Uh, and these are some of the names of uh, some foremost uh, 
rabbinic authorities from very early periods of uh, halachic uh, jurisprudence, but also in relatively late periods. It's like uh, for those who are familiar with the history of Haredi Judaism, the Khatam Sofer is perhaps the most important figure. And he's, all, he's Ashkenazi, by the way. And he was very clear that somebody who comes from a B'nai Anusim background, we should not only accept them fully as Jews, we could even accept their Kohanim as Kohanim in the community, right? And that was, that's very recent and that's also Ashkenazi. But I think if one uh, opinion is one that probably holds the uh, you know, significant weight, not only in this room, but in rooms throughout the Jewish world, it's the opinion of the Maran Shulchan Aruch, the rabbi who wrote the Shulchan Aruch, perhaps the most uh, authoritative, authoritative uh, piece of halachic work in the, that's recognized in the Jewish world today is the Shulchan Aruch. And uh, Rav Yosef Kyle wrote it. And in his, uh, to quote him, he says that uh, about Bnei Nusim, if they practice kashrut amongst themselves and cannot flee to a place where they can serve Hashem, we trust in their shahita, we trust in their ritual slaughter, uh, and we do not forbid drinking the wine that they touch, right? This sounds like a very specific detail, right? We're talking about, uh, Amaran here is talking about uh, their ritual, their kosher meat and their and their kosher wine being 100% kosher. So we understand, we have a principle in halakha, right? Kal v'chomer, right? So if kal, this is like an easy example, something to do with kashrut, then Homer, a serious example, accepting them as Jews, then of course we accept them as Jews. So the Shulchan Aruch was very clear that B'nai Anusim, people that come from the background that we're discussing, that uh, assuming that they continue to live amongst each other in a uh, collective, in a community, uh, they are considered Jews just like any other Jew. And there is no process that they need to uh, you know, go through in order to be accepted as such. So I want to bring this back into what we were saying in the beginning of this uh, lecture. And that's that this is an issue that every single Jew needs to be thinking about today. Not just as Jews, but, but certainly as Zionists, because we care about the Jewish future. This is our third uh, attempt to have sovereignty in the land of our ancestors. Um, and it comes with incredible victories, triumphs, and miracles, but also comes with an incredible amount of challenges. Because today, um, 74 years into the existence of the, the modern state of Israel, we have populations throughout the world that are re-emerging on the main stage and are saying, hey, we grew up knowing that we're Jewish. We have this Jewish identity. And even though our grandparents and our great-grandparents kept it secret, or at least didn't talk about it out in the open. Uh, this is who we are. And this issue touches on the experience of a lot of different populations, not one single group. We spend a lot of time talking about the Sephardic diaspora uh, and the Sephardic experience. Uh, that's why I included here this photo of this uh, article from the Jerusalem Post, which says that genetic research shows that something like a quarter of Latinos uh, in not just in America, but also Latinos in general in South America have Sephardic ancestry, right? That's a major phenomenon that has the result of that has meant millions of people in Brazil, Mexico, the Caribbean, um, and also in the United States that are starting to reorganize their communities, not just in secret, but out in the open as practicing identifying Jews. That's one issue. Another issue, is the story of those who are connected to uh, the northern tribes of Israel. Some people call them lost tribes. I prefer to refer to them as the northern tribes because some of them, uh, although they might have been lost to us, many of them were not lost to themselves, right? So it's all based on how you define lost. Uh, so I prefer to use the term northern tribes. Um, and we can see with the example of uh, Beta Israel, uh, Ethiopian Jewry, um, the Igbo in Nigeria, the Bnei Menashe in India, that we have communities that have a very, very ancient Jewish identity, a consistent Jewish practice, but because of influences from colonialism, from uh, Christian supremacy, and in some cases, Muslim supremacy, uh, have been forced to hide their Jewish identity, to behave outwardly as Christians or as another religion, 
but yet have maintained this Jewish identification and practice from generation to generation. So this reemergence of this phenomenon of B'nai Anusim is something that is, keeps coming up on the national agenda and the collective society does not have an answer for it yet. Certainly the government as a result of that also does not have an answer for it. In 2015, if I'm not mistaken, the Ministry of Diaspora um, uh, created a committee that their job was to research and make recommendations based on this phenomenon. And basically what they found is that, yes, this is a real issue. This is a real problem. Um, they, tried, they focused on some groups while completely ignoring other groups. Um, but in terms of the recommendations, they basically just said, we need to keep researching this issue. And as Zionists, as Herutniks, that's not a good enough answer because the state of Israel exists to be a home for all of the Jewish people regardless of where you come from, regardless of where you look like, and certainly without respect to what the specific experience of your ancestors was in exile, because the purpose of Zionism is to give an antidote to exile. And so we have people throughout the world that are still struggling with the pain and difficulties that exile presents them. And the state of Israel is not yet able to provide them with a meaningful answer, uh, with a meaningful solution to their problems. And in the meanwhile, we have another issue that we're dealing with in the land of Israel, and that's that we're constantly in a demographic battle for our sovereignty, right? The land of Israel, as we know, is the indigenous homeland of the Jewish people. We've been here since the beginning, and we're never, and we're back, and we're never going anywhere. But we have another people that are sharing this land with us uh, that are not Jewish, that are Arab. Um, and in order for us to merit, to have sovereignty over this entire land, we need to have a Jewish majority everywhere in this land. And the only way that we can do that uh, is by allowing the people that are actually identifying and living their Jewish identity every single day to make their home in the state of Israel. And so with that, the Herut movement says that our answer to this needs to be one that provides for the Jewish people in all of these various communities, that gives them an, an avenue for them to not only be recognized, to be a part of the Jewish mainstream, but also one that allows for them to make Aliyah and live in the land of their ancestors. So, Nanusim reclaiming their Jewish heritage is a victory our ancestors over those who tried to destroy us. From Ethiopia to Brazil, and might I add, from Nigeria to India, a Jew is a Jew. That is the message. So that is my presentation. Uh, and uh, perhaps now we can open it up for questions and have a discussion about this issue. Thank you, Yermiyahu. That was excellent. I loved it. Um, Okay, so now we are open for questions. If you would not, if you don't want to speak it out, you can type it in the chat box, and I will, um, I'll read it out. Um, I have a question here. Um, for the Bene Anusim, how do they know um, that they are? Um, they have Jewish ancestry. Uh, what is the DNA testing markers? Do they have, you know, they have certain locuses and all those things. Are you aware of this? And um, could you just perhaps, you know, um, let me know, let us know what are the markers for the DNA testing? I guess some of them here would mm -hmm. like to know as well. Sure. Okay. So first thing I want to emphasize is that the phenomenon of DNA and uh, genetic testing is something relatively new, not just for humanity, uh, but certainly for the Jewish world, right? We've been functioning as a people for uh, close to 4,000 years. Uh, and so we're still adjusting to some of these new technologies. Um, one thing that's very, that needs to come out very clearly is that DNA doesn't define who is a Jew, right? What defines Jewishness uh, is first and foremost, uh, the concept of uh, tradition and culture that's passed down from generation to generation. 
because you know some people try and describe the Jewish people as a race. Some people mm-hmm. try and describe us as a religion. Neither of those terms are accurate descriptions of the totality of what is the Jewish experience. What we really are is a tribe, right? We're something that's way older than all of these kind of modern, in particular Western uh, definitions. Um, And so that's why we never fit neatly into these definitions. Uh, That being said, the fact that Jewishness and Judaism as a civilization has encouraged our ancestors for generations and generations to marry in to be endogamous, that has created a reality that means that we have certain genetic uh, mutations that you can see in tests that point to, okay, these people are related, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so that means that you will have people that don't have those markers at all, but are also Mm -hmm. descended from ancient Israel or not descended from ancient Israel and are still 100% Jewish, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So that be, so with all of that taken into consideration, there are certain haplotypes that uh, are associated with ancient Jewish populations. Um, and those are J1, J2, uh, uh, EB1B, if I'm not mistaken. These are ancient haplotypes that, that tend to belong to people that come from ancient descent to the Levant. That's the region in which our ancestors come from. So if you look at ancient Jewish populations, whether they're Ashkenazi or Cochin, or uh, Ethiopian or Mizrahi, you'll find you'll see that there's a high uh, uh, preponderance of those haplogroups amongst those populations. So that's just a little bit about the genetics. Um, but the reality is the majority of Bnei Anusim don't find out about that through genetic testing, right? Mm-hmm. Usually, what it is is from word of mouth. Oh. Families that generation to generation. Mm-hmm heard from their mother, from their grandmother, from their grandfather, that, hey, we're Jews. And even if they didn't use the word Jews, they would say things like, by the way, we come from Israel, you know, and or they would do things in the home that only Jews do. They would light candles on Friday night. They would, uh, they would, they wouldn't eat certain types of animals, you know. And so these are things that the preponderance of all these You know, if I'm going to use an example of one community that follows kind of broadly under this definition, um, a lot of uh, Caribbean people and African Americans are a community that has maintained uh, a Hebrew identification for thousands of years. Uh, and so, but those same Caribbean people and African Americans don't, didn't maintain their Jewish identification because of slavery. Slavery cut those things off. Yet after slavery, you have a lot of people who have stories from their childhood about them not leaving the house on from Friday night to Saturday night, not eating pork, lighting candles on Friday night, you know, and, and little things here and there that pointed them in the direction of being B'nai Anusim, right? So there's, there's basically two categories. You have B'nai Anusim that are from established communities, the entire community knew secretly that they were B'nai Nusim and they kept practicing Judaism to the best of their ability in secret. And those that are more spread out individuals that kind of kept it, you know, they had their identity very secret. They kind of just heard it word of mouth. They kept one or two customs, right? Those are also B'nai Nusim, but there are two types. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question here. Um, Einstein, Einstein is from Goa. Um, he say any specific documentation of Jews being killed in the Inquisition in the 1500s in Goa? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the, the inquisitors were quite uh, detailed in a lot of their documents. We have a lot of information about what happened during the Inquisition in Goa, even though nowadays it's not really talked about. Um, but the Inquisition in Goa, uh, in particular, what was done to Hindus is very well documented. Um, it's about Jews less, but we do have information uh, documented uh, uh, burning at the stake 
of a Jew in 1540s, if I'm not mistaken. But that's something you can look up on the internet, and there's there is a uh, certainly a wealth of information there. Um, I would just like to add to that that since I live in Goa, um, there's a street called Jew Street, which is in um, in all Goa. Okay, um, and uh, that was where the Portuguese main hub was, the administrative hub. Um, and the whole street, 500 years ago, you know, they used to put the Jews on the stakes and burn them alive. Um, and there was a lot of documentation. There's even a book which I can, uh, which I can uh, recommend to you guys. Um, just PM me, and I, I will. I will give you the title of the book. It's called Jews in Goa. Jews in Goa, Jews of Goa. There's also a book, if I'm not mistaken, called The Inquisition in Goa, which goes into detail about the full extent of the Inquisition because the Inqui although Jews suffered uh, you know, disproportionately from the Inquisition, the Inquisition in Goa was unique in the fact that it not just attacked, it didn't only did attack uh, Jews and Muslims, but also had a, a particular animus against Hindus as well, um, which made a lot of um, long lasting trauma for a lot of Hindus that live in the region around Goa to this day. Um, Yermi, I have a question here. What about the, the Cochini Jews and the, um, the Pardesi Jews, which came to, to, uh, to Kerala? Um, why were they not being targeted by the Portuguese? So for the basic answer is that uh, the Portuguese didn't really have uh, a lot of influence there, right? Mm -hmm. they, they had their control over Goa um, and they were limited in the, to the effect they could actually target and persecute the Jews uh, in Canada, right? Um, and that's one of the reasons why you have this kind of thriving Sephardic community which takes up, which basically gets up, leaves Goa, and just goes and settles in uh, amongst the Cochin community, because for them that was the safe haven, right? They they had that was their way to get to get away from. It. But yeah, on, on the other hand, the question then we have to ask is, why didn't everybody just leave? And we have to understand is that with being in Goa, despite all the persecution, also came a great amount of economic benefit, right? It was a market. It was a it was a hub. For uh, for trade and for wealth, um, you know. So leaving that world, which was really this kind of outpost of the West in India, to go and live in the Cochin community or in Kerala was a very drastic change. And we can, if we look, uh, get into the history of the community in Cochin, you can see that even there there was this uneasy divide within the Jewish community there. You had your Sephardic Jews, which were called quote unquote white Jews. And you had your, your Malabar Jews, which were called quote unquote black Jews, right? And so they had different customs, they had different histories and they, in, they eventually integrated almost completely. You know, today in Israel, the in basically the entire Cochin Jewish communities in Israel today, they don't live separately from each other. They're one community, they've completely integrated. But it, it was many generations of a very difficult integration these Sephardic Jews in that community is because, you know, as much as they want to get away from the uh, Inquisition, they also wanted to be in a surrounding that was familiar to them. Thank you. Is there any questions um, on the um, Sephardi Jews or anything coming to your mind? Uh, perhaps, Jeff, thank you for coming in and joining us. Would you like to comment on something here? Yeah. I have a question. One of the problems I have in the United States is that um, everybody thinks they're the Jewish police, meaning, oh, you're not really observant, so you're not really Jewish. Is that, do you find that in the Sephardic community internationally? Absolutely. Look, I think the, the I'll say it this way, right? Because Sephardic community internationally, for good or for bad, doesn't exist in a bubble. So there, there's within the history of Sephardic halakha, 
uh, and Jew, you know, Jewish prudence, the way in which we deal with issues related to Hebrew law, custom, and ancestry. I think we lost Yermi Yahu. He'll be back. We lost him for a bit. Is it because I'm Jewish? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> we'll wait for him to come back. But I, I have that problem a lot with people that they say, well, you know, not really Jewish. I said, well, you're not the Jewish police, exactly. and neither am I. I said, I don't even have a badge. We don't need to wear a badge. You wore a badge <laughs> 70, 80 years ago, and it was terrible. Yeah. Nazi Germany. Exactly. Hey, sorry about that. Am I back? Yes, you are. Okay, Loud great. and clear. Loud and clear. Continue, please. Yes. Yeah, so I was just saying that you know the, the Sephardic world doesn't exist in a vacuum today. So even though traditionally the approach to this from the Sephardic perspectives has been much more, let's say, holistic, flexible. Um, today, the Sephardic world is very much uh, competing with the Ashkenazic world, right? And there's a lot of good things that that comes with as well, right? Because now, instead of being, you know, incredibly separate and, uh, and saying, okay, this is an Ashkenazic issue, this is a Sephardic issue, now there's no such thing as an issue which is entirely Ashkenazic or entirely Sephardic. We're all mixed, right? We're all together. And that's an incredible blessing. On the other hand, uh, if somebody is from the Ashkenazic world is being very critical about something, you know, like you said, policing somebody's Jewishness and then trying to be more strict than the next guy, then often the Sephardic hacham, the Sephardic rabbi um, feels compelled to be even more strict, right? So that's something which uh, definitely plays out in these different spaces, whether it's in the world of rabbinics or in the world of academia and in the world of politics. Um, this is a major issue. Uh, I think it's appropriate to define it that way. Uh, but um, yeah, it's something that we need to contend with because um, if we're going to have good responses to this issue, we're going to need to think out the box and, and uh, policing each other's Jewishness is not the way. Um, I, I could tell you a little anecdote uh, I, uh, about the Bnei Anusim community in Ethiopia. They're called the Falash Mora. Uh, in the late 1800s, they were forced to convert to Christianity basically so they can get food. They were starving. And the, the government said, if you convert to Christianity, we're going to give you food to eat. And a lot of uh, Ethiopian Jews converted to Christianity outwardly in order to get the food. Um, and the second, there was a major movement amongst the Ethiopian Jewish community to come back to Israel, a major Zionist revolution in Ethiopian Jewish society. A lot of those people that were uh, secretly practicing Judaism started saying, hey, we, we want to go home too. Right. We've been we're surviving like this for a couple of generations now. We're really Jewish. We've been practicing Judaism secretly all for the past two generations. We want to come back into the fold. And um, there was a big debate in Israeli society, even amongst the uh, Ethiopian Jewish community as to how they should respond to this. But ultimately, the political decision, as well as the um, as well as the religious decision on behalf of the leadership of Ju uh, the Ethiopian Jewish communities to re receive them right, to, to, to take them back. And so they've been making Aliyah in small trickles since the 1990s, um, despite the fact that there's been government uh, decisions that have said we're going to allow everybody to come. They haven't allowed everybody to come back at one moment. And as a result, you have families that are divided, grandparents that are stuck in Ethiopia while their children are in, uh, in Israel uh, and vice versa. And, um, and I read an article uh, that somebody had sent me not long ago saying that they had visited this community in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, um, and there all the Jews live together. You know, it's a very dilapidated, uh, unfortunate situation. Um, they have a synagogue in the middle. Uh, and somebody went, somebody who from America went to go visit this community to go see what it's like. And they're like, oh, it's, it, was, they did, it was Shabbat. It was beautiful. They had services. You know, it was all singing. It was something very familiar to me. But after I saw later in the day that one of the uh, young men of the community was uh, using his phone, his cell phone. 
So therefore, and this was the person's conclusion, the entire community is basically just doing a show to pretend like they're Jewish. And that's, and, and, that, and that what we need to do is stop this charade and end all of the Aliyah from Ethiopia. And, you know, I was seeing how people were sending me this article, uh, basically look at this, like, here you go. This, this is what's going on. This is the reality on the ground. And my response to all of them was the same. If this ex same exact scenario was in America or Canada or France, you would see how ridiculous this is. The fact that you have young teenage boys not keeping Shabbat to a T, that should be, that's a question even. You know, in the West, you take that for granted, of course. Being Jewish has never been easy. It wasn't easy 3,000 years ago. It's not easy today. You know, and the idea that, that somebody who belongs to one of these communities with a very difficult, uh, diff very difficult circumstances in history would be a perfect Jew is absolutely absurd. You know, so we need to, we need to cut that out and just start and get back to the basics of what it means to be a, a Jew that's committed to his people and his homeland. Thank you. Um, Ariella here has a question. She, Ariella, can you, could, okay, she says here, uh, if one puts the Torah in the center, then culture will not be a deal. Culture is the one heading towards, okay, the culture is the one creating the racism. Mm. Did I, I, I think I, I got that quite right, <laughs> Ariella. Yeah, I would just say that, look, we don't exist in a vacuum, right? Just like the, I said before, the Sephardic world doesn't exist in the vacuum from the Ashkenazi world and vice versa. Like it was with human beings don't exist in a vacuum, you know, and it says in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in Parashat Hazino, uh, you know, Hashem says to us that the Torah isn't in heaven. It's closer to you than your heart. It's closer to you than your, than your own tongue it's 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 here with you and so there's a lot of different meaning that we can derive from that but one of that is that the torah doesn't exist in a vacuum anymore right culture is a reality it was a reality in ancient israel where we were affected by other nations for good and for bad it was a reality when we were in babylon you know i mean there's so many places i can point to you in the babylonian talmud where i say like this is an influence from babylon this is an influence from persian even our own hebrew language it is rich with influences from ancient Greek, ancient Latin, today from Arabic, from English, right? So I don't think that culture is something that we should be uh, worried about in the sense that uh, we need to focus just on, on the spiritual aspects of Torah. I think what's beautiful about Torah is that it can interact with our culture. It can uplift the aspects of our culture that are connected to a holy place, and it can reduce the aspects of our culture that are that are connected to a, let's say, not holy place. And that's ultimately the purpose of the Torah, is that we create a nation, Am Yisrael, that its culture emanates the, the ideal of the divine Torah. That's, that's the concept of a, of a goy kadosh, a holy nation, mamlechet koanim, a nation of priests. It is that through the language, through our culture, through our, our traditions and customs, we then exude the, the, the ideal that is the Torah. Amen. Amen to that. I have one question here. Um, the governments of Spain and Portugal have announced some time back that those who are uh, conversos, um, you know, uh, they if they can come back to Spain and Portugal and get um, their, you know, citizenship. Um, I'm just thinking out loud. Okay, I could be wrong. If these two countries are accepting their people back, uh, who is in the diaspora, why not Israel? What is actually stopping Israel from accepting the conversos back? This is my question. So there's two, there's two problems. The way that the um, both bureaucrats and decision makers are looking at these issues. Number one is just, as we, I think it goes without saying, but it's important to say it anyways, just plain old prejudice and discrimination, 
right? You see people coming from uh, third world countries. You see people that generally have darker skin and you say, okay, that's something that we don't want to deal with because it's bad for the economy. It's bad for the social makeup of the, of the country, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that unfortunately is an element of this, right? And we don't need to deny that. We should need to acknowledge it because it's just, it, it plays out on a regular basis. And in order for us to defeat it, we need to know what it is we're up against. That's the first one. The second one is rooted in a place which I think a lot of us can relate to a lot more. Uh, and that's the concern about the religious character of these communities, right? Um, there is a misnomer that there is a large number of people from Banan Muslim ancestry in South America and Africa and India who want to come to Israel, but really are still Christian or are still whatever the religion they are. Mostly Christianity is the, is the, uh, uh, the prevalent religious uh, experience. A lot of these people are leaving. So there's this idea that really it's this kind of missionary work that's, that's kind of happening and that people are coming and they're gonna bring Christianity with them. Um, that's, the, that's the lie that's kind of being told. Uh, and so we need to just be aware that it's out there. Uh, and when we're having these conversations, whether it's on the internet or with our fellow Jews or, or in political spaces, that we need to let them know that that's not a, a good enough excuse the uh, we, it's just in the same way that anybody who makes Aliyah from the former Soviet Union or from the uh, United States or from the UK should be asked, are you a practicing Christian? Would you, are you Jewish? Do you belong to a Jewish, Jewish community? The same exact questions could be asked to people that come from a banana seam background without uh, a discriminatory twist. So the, there's, there's two reasons. Number one is just uh, blatant discrimination. The second is a fear of a Christian influence. And both of those issues uh, can be solidly refuted. Thank you. Thank you, Yirmiyahu. Um, wow, that's a lot of take in. Thank you. Uh, any questions, comments, please, before we wrap it up? Are there any books which you would uh, encourage us to, to read on the subject? Yeah, so first thing, uh, I think that uh, a book that's important not only for the history of the Inquisition, but also the history of anti-Semitism is Ben Sion Netanyahu's Origins of the Inquisition. Um, you know, ben Netanyahu as in the father of Benjamin Netanyahu, for those that are that heard the name and their ears kind of pricked up. Um, <laughs> it's a very important book. Um, there's also the, uh, the Jews of the Caribbean, I'm forgetting the author, but it also talks about the history of one uh, of the very important uh, banana seam communities that went all over the uh, Caribbean islands. Um, and I think the Inquisition in Goa is also a very good book where people can read a lot about how the Inquisition played out uh, in very close to them. So um, and of course, if anybody has any questions later that they remember, they always feel free to uh, reach out to me uh, and ask. And uh, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this was such an incredible pleasure. Thank you so much, Yermiyahu. Um, anyone with comments before we, we say good night? I'm sure your stomachs are rumbling for dinner, the ones in India. <laughs> Ariella, anything to add? I have to say something. Yes, please. Yeah. Yirbyaho and his presentation was just now awesome, enlightening, and I just don't have the voice proper voice. Okay. So it's just like you know, uh, full of learning and all those things. Yeah. We Thank would you. like Thank to see so him much. again. We, yeah, we would like to see him again and meeting and all those things, yeah. Baruch Hashem, we will, definitely. Thank you, Mordecai. Hezrat Hashem. Thank you. So um, I'm gonna wrap it up and I thank everyone, Jeff uh, from US, Yermiahu, and my friends from Malaysia and uh, Aherud Nix in India. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful week ahead. Shavua Tov and uh, we'll keep in touch. Shalom. Shavua Tov. Bye. Laila Tov, thank you. Bye bye. Shalom Tov, Laila Tov. Shalom.
Shavuot. Shavuot. Thank you. Bye, Bye, Ariella. Take care. Bye, Rishon. Bye, bye. Shalom. Alan. Shalom. You know what's